Anyway, so today um, I'm going to tell you about uh, some things that I've been doing, but I'm going to present most of the work that I'm going to present has been uh, done uh, by uh, my actual postdoc, Anna Niemiec, and uh, my student, Su Tieng Tam, who is defending her PhD at the end of this month. Um, and basically, I'm going to center my talk around uh, what I call cosmic beasts, so the most massive uh, galaxy clusters. So I'm going to start by introducing the main tool that I'm using, which is gravitational lensing. So for the people that know me, uh, you know that I've been doing that for many years now. And uh, talk about observations, uh, what we need to do the analysis that I'm going to present. And uh, then present some of the things that you can do with uh, those objects, uh, like in a pretty uh, uh, broad uh, uh, vision. And then I'll conclude and uh, give you some hints on what's happening next. So uh, to start with, this is a, a screenshot from the Millennium 2 simulation that you might have seen before. So what you can see is the distribution of dark matter of a really large scales. Uh, so the, the matter accrete, um, is accreted along those filaments. And today in my talk, I'm going to concentrate at, uh, on the uh, intersection of those filaments, which are um, hosting those really massive uh, galaxy clusters that I call cosmic beasts and that are also called uh, nodes of the cosmic web. So like I said, I'm using uh, the main tool I'm using and I insist this is a tool. This is not uh, uh, anything more than this, is uh, gravitational lensing. So if you look at the, um, at the image on the, on the left, uh, you can see an optical bench where the observer is here. You have a galaxy uh, that is emitting uh, a source. Um, if there is nothing between us uh, and this galaxy, then you're going to see this uh, galaxy uh, intrinsically fainter and fainter as it's further and further away from us. However, if you end up putting something in between this galaxy and us, then the light rays are going to be uh, distorted, uh, magnified, and in that sense, uh, being uh, lensed. If you look at the picture that uh, you can see on the right hand side of the slide, it's uh, uh, Einstein and Eddington sitting on a, on a bench in, a, in a Cambridge in 2019, uh, in 1919, sorry. Um, and the, uh, the reason why I'm putting this uh, picture here is because lensing was predicted by GR uh, based on the assumption that an imported mass density is going to locally deform the space time. And it's purely geometrical, has no dependence with the photon energy, but this was just a hypothesis back then. And Eddington in 1919 was actually uh, the first one to confirm, uh, uh, first of all, the lensing uh, hypothesis, and that was also the first observational confirmation of GR. So here is a quick um, history uh, uh, reminder. Uh, how did he do that? So what happened is that on the 29th of May, 1919, there was a total solar eclipse happening in front of a really bright constellation of stars. And that was visible um, from, um, if you look at the uh, image on the left, from uh, Brazil and um, Africa. So what Eddington did is that in January and February, uh, he measured the true position of the stars from Oxford and uh, then sent two teams, uh, one in Brazil and one in uh, Principe, a, a small island on the western coast of Africa. He was part of the African uh, trip uh, to uh, ensure against bad weather and have, uh, ensure to have like good measurements. So during the totality of the eclipse, they measured uh, the new position of, uh, of the stars in the constellation. Both teams were uh, lucky enough that they uh, both bought uh, measurements. In November 1919, uh, he published his results. So as much as Newtonian gravity is also predicting an offset in position between uh, with such an event, the offset measured by Eddington was uh, uh, agreeing with uh, the one predicted by GR and non Newton in uh, gravity. So like I said, that was the first observational confirmation of GR actually. So we go back to our optical bench and uh, now you have a small equation um, put on, uh, on my slide um, and that is alpha. Alpha is, so if you have your lens, uh, your, like I said, your light rays are going to be distorted and deviated and even magnified in some cases. 
And so your source is going to appear at an angular position in the lens plane alpha. And so this alpha is uh, equal to a cosmological distance ratio, which is the distance between the lens and the source and us and the source times the gravitational potential uh, of the lens. And what is interesting and important here is that this gravitational potential is directly proportional to the total mass of the lens. So if you believe in dark matter, for example, and uh, I, I, I kind of do, so I'm, I'm going to assume I'm going to assume that dark matter exists um, all, all during this, all along this talk. Uh, this is a, a, an excellent and one of the most efficient tools to actually uh, understand and trace uh, dark matter, uh, because, like I said earlier, there is no dependence uh, with photon energy. So here uh, today, the lens is going to be uh, a galaxy cluster, and uh, so those are the most massive observable uh, structures. And in a cluster, you're going to observe mainly two lensing regimes. So if you look at the small animation that I have here, you can see in the center uh, of the cluster when uh, it's the reddest. So this is the density uh, in, a, in, a, in pinkish. Um, distortions are going to be large. Uh, you're going to observe gravitational arcs, multiple images, like your wavefront is going to be uh, um, uh, broken uh, by uh, the gravitational potential um, of, the, of the lens, and you're going to be in the strong lensing regime. As you're going further and further away from the cluster core, you're going to uh, enter the weak lensing regime, where distortions are going to be much, much smaller. And in this case, it's not going to be visible on an image. You're going to need a statistical analysis of this deformation. But I'll, I'll present that uh, in a few slides. So let's go back to history, uh, because I kind of like this uh, part of history, so I repeat myself in seminars. Um, so gravitational lensing in clusters um, goes back to uh, 1987, when uh, the first giant arc was discovered in uh, a well-known cluster, uh, thanks to that actually, ABO 370. So on the left here, you can see the CFHT, uh, CFHT image uh, on which the team worked. Um, and you can see that in the southern part, I'm sorry, you can't see my mouse, um, this extended feature that is a bit curved um, down to the, um, to the, the bright galaxy. And uh, in 1988, uh, they uh, published a spectroscopy um, of this feature and uh, realized that uh, actually this uh, was a galaxy, an object that was behind the cluster. So the cluster is at 0.375 in redshift, and this object is at 0.725. So that was the first confirmation of cluster uh, strong lensing. However, uh, I insist by saying that they were extremely lucky uh, because uh, those objects, most of the uh, lensing objects are extremely, uh, extremely faint. They're usually not uh, extended. And uh, so to see them, uh, you need really high resolution data. And this is extremely difficult to observe from the ground. And uh, to uh, give you an idea about that is exactly the same field observed with Hubble in 1996 by the camera with PIC2. You can see clearly the extended arc that, I was, uh, uh, that is uh, uh, seen in the CFHT image. But you can so see also in the northern part, some other arcs are extremely faint. Uh, and invisible on the CFHT image. So basically what I'm trying to say here is that without Hubble, it would have been almost impossible to do uh, properly uh, uh, cluster lensing analysis. So and what I said earlier is that the good thing with lensing is that the angular position of your lens image is going to be uh, proportional to your gravitational potential, which is proportional, proportional to uh, the total mass. So from there, what you can do is either you can try to study like so dark matter, like I said, because you can directly observe stars, you can directly observe the gas in a cluster. And so by a simple uh, subtraction, you can, uh, uh, you can get the dark matter distribution. Then if you also uh, remember what I said, is that your light rays are magnified. Um, and uh, this uh, magnification will help you see extremely faint objects and distant objects that would not be seen in a blank field. 
So you can use that, your cluster, as a natural telescope in order to observe the high redshift universe, for example. But again, I'll, I'll give you a few examples of that uh, later on. Another point is that it's also um, sensitive to the geometry you can, uh, of the universe. You can uh, use lensing to constrain um, cosmological parameters uh, thanks to the different uh, lens objects at different redshifts. So you can, uh, you, can, um, you can sample the redshift space behind a cluster. Uh, I'm not going to talk about that today, but I'm happy to answer any questions uh, later on. So then we move on to weak lensing. Uh, so we in the basically in the outskirts um, of uh, clusters, and uh, in theory, uh, weak lensing is pretty simple because it's what we call the linear regime of lensing. And so, basically, your in the weak lensing regime, only the ellipticity of your source is going to be uh, 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 distorted by your cluster. So basically, the ellipticity you observe, so the ellipticity of the image is equal to the ellipticity of the source, so the intrinsic ellipticity of the object, plus a lensing uh, term, which is gamma over one minus kappa, gamma being the shear and kappa being the convergence. <coughs> so basically what's gonna happen if you look at the, at the sketch below is that imagine your uh, lens source is purely circular, you apply some lensing, the shear, uh, the convergence is gonna increase the size of your source and the shear is going to reduce it in one direction and stretch it in the other. So from a purely circular galaxy, you lens it, you end up with an ellipse. So this is the theory, but in practice, it's not that easy, um, unfortunately, because you don't know the true uh, ellipticity of your source. And so what we're going to do is that we're going to, uh, if you look at this, um, at this simulation here, so on the left hand side, you can clearly see the core of the cluster in the left uh, uh, bottom corner where the distortions are, are pretty, uh, pretty large and, uh, and obviously visible by eye. And if you look at the square in the corner, which has a zoom in on the right hand side, um, this is the weak lensing regime. You look at the, at the, at the sources and by eye like this, you can think that all your sources are distorted uh, quite randomly. However, if you average over this region, you will see if you can see the, the small... Um, um, ah, I'm losing my words. Uh, at the top right corner, I'm missing a word. Uh, alignment. Yeah, thank you. Uh, you can see that there is a preferred alignment if you uh, average uh, over uh, all of the sources. So if we go back to our initial equation, uh, if you average over a number, a sufficiently large number of galaxies, and that depends on your data, but we can talk about that later on, um, and you assume that on average, because you have a sufficient number of sources, the intrinsic electricity of your source is uh, random, then this term goes to zero and the ellipticity of your image is directly basically the lensing term. So this is basically how you do uh, weak lensing. Um, I'll finish my introduction by showing the sketch that you're going to see um, on uh, most of my slides on the top right corner uh, because I'm going to chat about basically three different scales today. So the really inner core of the cluster where you're going to have the strong lensing the up to the zero radius of the cluster where you observe weak lensing and then we're going to even go further uh, where you're going to start tracing the infall of matter from the large scale filaments if you remember the millennium 2 snapshot that i showed earlier but like i said lensing is just a tool and with just lensing you can't do much so we will um, as you'll see you need to combine with multi-wavelength uh, observations in order to have um, to draw conclusions. So now let's move on to what we need to do uh, lensing, basically, a lensing analysis. So this is the, the core of a cluster uh, called ABLE 2744. And all the small circles that you can see on this image are actually lensed uh, multiple images of sources uh, that are behind the cluster. And uh, even though, so it's not obvious that all of this uh, uh, circle are highlighting a source because some of them are extremely faint, 
But uh, because they're extremely thin, you can imagine that, like I said earlier, ground-based data are uh, not uh, um, uh, allowing you to detect those. So basically, you need high-resolution data. And up to now, it's basically only HSC, so the, the Hubble that can uh, uh, provide us with that. But also, if you remember the angular position equal the cosmological distance ratio, uh, times the gravitational potential, you need to know the distance of the sources to us. So you need spectroscopic redshift. Um, and um, so to basically, if we concentrate on the strong lensing for now, um, the deep high resolution imaging um, have, been, uh, have been provided by uh, an observing campaign called the Hubble Frontier Fields. So I know that some of you uh, have heard about that. So basically, it was um, it's the those are the deepest observations of cluster cores that have the, ever been uh, uh, taken, but only on six clusters. And the idea behind the campaign was to go extremely deep on the cluster cores to use strong lensing, uh, and those clusters that are extremely strong lenses. Uh, in order to observe the high redshift universe. So use this magnification and this uh, natural uh, telescope effect that is provided by uh, lensing. However, you, as much as you can study the high redshift universe, you can also detect so many strong, uh, strongly lens objects that you can uh, recover uh, the mass of your clusters and in your cluster cores with uh, extremely high uh, precision. So, while at HSC is giving you this extremely high resolution imaging and extremely deep, still you don't have distances to your uh, lens sources. And another uh, really uh, amazing uh, instrument uh, that uh, uh, had a, its first light and back in the, the summer 2014 or winter 2014, depending on which is the hemisphere you're in, is uh, MUSE on the DLT. So MUSE is an IFU. So basically, it was a field of view of one by one square arc minute. And this is absolutely ideal because this is roughly the, the size of the core um, of a galaxy cluster at redshift 0.3.5. And uh, so here are examples of clusters that have been observed uh, with MUSE. But basically, if you want to uh, see, uh, get an idea of what you're getting is in the bottom right, you have an, uh, a Muse uh, uh, image uh, of ABLE 2744. So the same cluster I showed you before taken by, by HSC. And all the circles here are spectroscopic redshift measurements. So basically, because it's an IFU, you're getting a spectroscopic uh, redshift for each uh, object in your field. Obviously, depending on the observing time, but we can we can, um, we can um, discuss this later on. So this is a, another example, a recent work that uh, I've been doing with a student at EPFL, uh, Baptiste uh, uh, Klein. So we looked at uh, MUSE imaging of uh, three really massive galaxy clusters. Uh, you can see them uh, here. I can give you the names, but it's just a letter and number. So it means a lot to me and might not uh, to you. Uh, I just insist on the one on the left, MSO451, because I'm going to present uh, Su Tiang's work on this cluster, and she's using this, uh, these uh, observations. So basically what we did in this uh, analysis is that we use the HSC imaging plus the news uh, observations of, the cl of those clusters to get extremely precise mass models, because we could confirm, uh, first of all, multiplicity. So we have these objects that have similar colors, that have similar morphology, but we don't have the distance, but thanks to spectroscopy, we can know that they are like all multiple images of the same background source. And so we have, we end up with mass precision down to like a few percent. And uh, <clears throat> we even, because that's the power of news, we even could uh, detect uh, multiple images that are not even visible in the HSC uh, image. So as an example, if you look in MSO451, uh, on the right-hand side of the cluster image, you have R R1 and R2, and those two images are invisible on the HSC um, image, as an example. Anyway, so uh, we were concentrating basically on the strong lensing for now, 
but I cannot give a talk without uh, talking about Buffalo. So I'm sorry for the acronym in advance, uh, even though as one of the PI, I should assume it, but I do not. Uh, so Buffalo is a large HEC program that uh, we got awarded back in 2018. And um, if you remember what I was saying about the frontier fields, so the frontier fields is six clusters and only the core was observed, but extremely deep. Um, and so with Buffalo, what we asked for is a special extension uh, around the scores uh, in order to have high resolution data to do weak lensing, basically. So you can see the six fields uh, with the six mosaic um, on the left hand side. The, the idea behind Buffalo is not only the, the, the weak lensing, but also again, looking at the high universe and uh, properly do cosmological tests. And you understand why in a few slides, because like this, you can combine strong and weak lensing and properly map the mass distribution um, in your cluster. So now let's talk about a bit of science. Uh, but before that, I mean, I'm not saying that mass modeling is not science, but uh, it's a tool again. Uh, Says the mass modeler. So uh, <laughs> I'm allowed to say that. But anyway, so everything that I'm going to present now depends on mass models. So without reconstructing the mass distribution of your cluster, you can't do anything that I'm going to present after that. So basically, your mass modeling is extremely important. Um, and while depending on what you want to look at, you can concentrate on the core of clusters and so strong lensing on me. But if you want to look at structure evolution and formation and so on, you're going to need to combine the strong and the weak lensing regime. And for that, this is not as trivial as it seems because one is nonlinear, the strong lensing, and another one is linear, the weak lensing. Um, anyway, in Buffalo, and that was uh, uh, um, exported from the Frontier Fuel campaign, is that we have a mass modeling challenge uh, with uh, all, the, um, all the clusters being modeled by uh, basically almost all the teams that are doing uh, lensing mass modeling um, in the community. And we deliver uh, those, uh, those mass models to the community. So they're being uh, made public. So non-lensing experts basically can use those models to do the science um, uh, they want to. You have three panels at the bottom of my slide. They're showing you basically mass contours on the left. So what you recover from, uh, uh, from your mass model. Then you have uh, the density profiles and then you have magnification maps, magnification that are extremely important if you want to recover the intrinsic properties of your lens sources um, that you observe in the cluster core. I'll highlight some work done by Anna uh, because this is uh, really important. Uh, she developed a, a new method called a hybrid lens tool. Uh, why hybrid? Because lens tool already existed and it's the software that we, uh, we've been using for years. However, lens tool was incapable of uh, uh, properly combining uh, strong and weak lensing, but uh, she did it. Uh, it's been 10 years that uh, um, uh, Eric Julot and myself have tried to do it and she did it in a year and a half. So this is, uh, this is uh, quite, uh, quite amazing. I, I was, uh, anyway, I, uh, I, am, uh, I am extremely happy about that. Um, so basically it's, uh, if you look at the, the left, um, left panel, what you can see is a, a simulated cluster uh, mass distribution on the top, uh, top row. Uh, then basically what a hybrid lens tool is gonna do is it's gonna combine two different methods, which is a parametric method and a non-parametric uh, method. I'm not gonna enter the details. I'm happy to talk about that later on, but this can be quite boring if you're not doing uh, mass modeling. But basically the middle panel is showing you what we used to do is we first model the strong lensing separately, then we have a best fit, and then we add the, the weak lensing for the wider field of view. So this is what you have, uh, the recovery of, uh, of this mass distribution with the sequential fit. And then on the right hand side, you can see the joint fit. So the new method, so by eye, it's not, absolutely uh, crazy, crazily visible, the improvement. However, if you look on the uh, right uh, hand side with the panel, you can see the density as a function of uh, radius and the input is in black and the joint fit is in orange, 
and the sequential set is in uh, science. And what you can see is the sequential set tended to um, overestimate the mass distribution. And the joint fit there is giving you a much, uh, much more realistic recovery of the mass distribution. So basically like uh, the value I'm quoting in this slide is like with the joint fit, we're getting to up to one to up to 1.5 sigma from the true value uh, compared to a few sigmas beforehand. Anyway, so once you have your mass model, uh, and, uh, and obviously you're going to use table mensal because this is the best method ever. This is uh, me being extremely objective. Uh, you, can do, you can do many things. Um, so I'm going to start by uh, looking at the high redshift, even though this is not my expertise. Uh, this is uh, one of the main goal of all of those uh, uh, large program with Hubble. So Frontier Fields, Buffalo, and uh, uh, Relics also. Anyway, so you use this lens magnification in order to see really thin galaxies and uh, so extremely high uh, uh, redshift galaxy. So with Buffalo, uh, we reaching redshift, um, uh, redshift 10. Uh, so to give you an idea, uh, today um, Buffalo was designed to cover uh, to overlap with the speeds of coverage of uh, the frontier fields clusters. Um, and uh, the idea was uh, because Spitzer is the near infrared, so it gives you the age and the stellar mass, and um, HST will give you the what we call the photometric dropout, is that a, a method to confirm that your galaxy is um, is a really high redshift and not a, a, a more um, medium redshift, like less than three contaminants. So today we have around 25 galaxies at redshift eight to 10. Uh, with Buffalo, we expect uh, to add 10 to that. So 10 means maybe nothing to you, but this is basically half, almost half of what is uh, already existing. So this is basically tripling the, the sample of extremely high galaxy, um, high redshift galaxy, and uh, that will allow us to constrain uh, reionization, basically. So here are examples um, of uh, former uh, detections. So redshift 11, redshift 9, and redshift 10 in some clusters. Um, and uh, uh, now I'm, I'm, I'm going to move more to uh, cluster physics, uh, because this is my, uh, this is my, uh, my thing. Um, and uh, one thing that I got to know and that I was not uh, much aware of is uh, actually uh, intracluster light. And uh, so if you look at this uh, image on the left, you can see uh, um, the, the, the stellar distribution uh, in a cluster, which is a simulated cluster with a, obviously a hydrodynamical simulation, uh, sea eagle. And the bottom panel, you can see the ICL. So what is the ICL? The ICL is made of the stars that are not gravitational bound to galaxies. And so they're basically the result of galaxy interactions. And in some clusters, they can represent up to 40% of the stellar mass. So they're non it, it is a non-negligible uh, component. And uh, in a recent paper, uh, what they actually showed is that the ICL is also extremely well tracing the dark matter distribution, at least in cluster really in a course. The problem with the ICL is that you need, uh, uh, first of all, you need HST data. It's, uh, you can't do ICL studies with uh, uh, non-space uh, uh, non data because you need extremely high resolution. You need a, a data reduction that is extremely specific. Um, and uh, so it's been really difficult for ICL people to study the ICL in the outskirts of clusters because HSC time takes uh, cost uh, uh, a lot of money. And uh, so mosaic of a, a wide mosaic of a cl uh, around clusters are not that common. So that's why it's uh, quite a strong component of Buffalo because with this mosaic that are extending further away from the cluster core, they can try to study the ICL and uh, uh, try to understand really what it comes from. And one hypothesis is that it might actually have different origins depending on the region of the cluster where you trace it. So it can be the shredding of the dwarf, of dwarf galaxies. It can do, be due to violent mergers 
or pre-processing of uh, installing structures, so like smaller clusters or groups, um, etc. But basically, there is a there is a, a lot of work to do, and Buffalo data are, are really adapted to it. So now um, I'm going to talk about the cluster evolution, like um, um, related to basically uh, most of what I've been talking about is like lensing, combination of strong and weak lensing in order to map the entire mass distribution of your clusters. So as much as it is, it, it's, it's interesting uh, to uh, know the mass distribution of your cluster. So what you see on the, on the right hand side is an HSC image of a, one of the frontier field cluster and the blue haze is the dark matter distribution. And uh, so this is what you get from a strong plus weak lensing mass modeling. Um, and uh, what I highlight in orange are the different uh, uh, substructures in the cluster. So the cluster core is actually of this cluster is actually made of, uh, of two clusters that are uh, about to merge. Uh, but this is the strong lensing region. And then you have two other circles, orange circles, that are showing you like much lower mass uh, substructures. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, those two substructures are like group, group scale, uh, so 10 to a few 10 to the 13 solar mass. So from that, you can't do much if you want to look at, uh, if you want to understand the, the, the history of your cluster. However, what you can try to do is uh, to constrain a dark matter uh, uh, particle uh, nature. One way to do that is actually to count and weight the different substructures that I've been telling you about. And this is a basically different dark matter um, type are going to give you different observational signatures. And if you, so this is a sketch that I've made, uh, so don't take it extremely precisely, but that's to uh, illustrate uh, my words is that depending on if your ma dark matter is cold or self-interacting or warm, for example, you're going to have more or less of those substructures uh, that I'm, uh, I'm telling you about and that you detect from uh, your lensing uh, analysis. So basically, dark matter is going to change the lumpiness of your galaxy uh, cluster. Then you have other, uh, other uh, ways to uh, look at uh, uh, probes of dark matter using uh, uh, just a pure uh, mass uh, distribution is looking at uh, the, the shape of your strong lensing region in clusters. Um, and, uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions about that, but I'll, I'll just move on to, uh, to once you have your mass distribution, uh, you can count on weight your substructures and compare that with predictions from numerical simulations using different type of dark matter and so on. But if you're more interested into the uh, cluster evolution, so the, the growth of uh, clusters and, uh, and so on, your lensing is not going to be enough. I mean, your blue haze on your HSC image is beautiful for a press release, but that's basically it. Uh, you can't do much. So you're going to need to uh, turn to multi-wavelength observations. One of the main ones that we're using is obviously the x-rays because it gives you the hot gas distribution, the gas distribution in, uh, in your cluster, and, uh, and which is the second uh, most important component in your cluster. Um, and so what you're going to look at is the, 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 the different gas light or, or, or stellar distribution peaks compared to the dark matter, and that's going to give you um, an uh, insight on a, a, is your cluster merging, is your cluster not merging, is your cluster relaxed or not, and, uh, and uh, so on and uh, so forth. It can also be actually a probe of uh, dark matter uh, nature uh, because different dark matter are predicting also different uh, offsets, uh, um, could, can predict offsets between your dark matter peak and your light or uh, uh, gas uh, peak. But basically you can end up by retracing the history of your cluster as you can see here. So it's the same cluster and this is the story of what happened to it is that C1 is the main cluster, C2 is originating from um, the, the substructure detecting by uh, uh, weak lensing that we identified as being a, a, a large scale filament aligned uh, along the line of sight and it's on its way to merge with C1. So uh, it's just before the first core uh, passage, basically. 
so this is work that this is a work that I've done uh, two years ago, uh, a year and a half ago, um, and this is a really massive cluster called O717 that I also nickname my nightmare because I've been working on it since my PhD. And so what you can see here is basically the mass distribution of your cluster of the cluster. So in blue are all the substructures that I detected using strong and weak lensing. And this is of a really large scale. Um, and uh, sorry, in orange, and in blue are the counterparts in the uh, X-ray. And what it, what, what it tells you is that this cluster is extremely massive. Good. It tells you that it has a lot of infalling substructures. Good. But again, it doesn't tell you much at the end of the day in terms of growth of structure. This is a cluster that is one, it, it's actually the most massive cluster that we know of at a redshift of greater than 0.5. So then you can suppose that it can be a, a really good test for the cosmological paradigm. And so what you can do, and that's what uh, I did, is turn to numerical simulation to try to see if you can find those objects in numerical simulation. So we looked into sea eagles, so hydrodynamical simulation, as well as MXXL, but I'm, I'm not going to present the MXXL results today. But basically, we found one cluster of the 24 uh, that they have that had a similar mass. And we tried to identify the substructures, as you can see on the right hand side, all the, the science circles are substructures of like similar mass range to uh, what we had on the, on the, on the real uh, mass distribution of 0717. And we looked at the info uh, of the substructures as a function of redshift. And we could estimate a growth rate. Um, and we could also look at the gas fraction in those substructures, which is in excellent agreement with uh, what we measure from observations, with an infall distance between redshift 0.5 and point, uh, point 0.3 of roughly uh, 2 megaparsecs. But if I'm getting there, it's to show you that this is only one cluster, uh, but that one cluster is even, um, it, it's the progenitor of again, other massive clusters that we observe at lower redshift, like redshift 0.3. And you have an example on the plot on the right hand side with ABLE 2744, which is at 0.3. Uh, and you can see the distribution, the density profile of the core in dash, uh, the galaxy component in a dotted line, and of the substructures um, in, um, in a, a plain line. And what you can see is actually what we observe in terms of peak of substructure correspond to what is observed in the simulation. So such a cluster at 0.55 seems to be a progenitor of a similar cluster at 0.3, like uh, ABLE 2744. ABLE 2744 was the subject of papers where it was uh, a candidate for ruling out lambda CDM. And uh, the message here is that basically, if you do a proper comparison between simulations and observations, you can, uh, first of all, actually do a consistent test of uh, cosmology. And that even if those clusters are at the limit of the lambda CDM paradigm, uh, lambda CDM for now is still holding. I'll uh, finish up by talking about uh, the work uh, from um, uh, Su Tiang, so my student that I mentioned earlier on MSO451, that one cluster that I showed you earlier. And so the idea of her work was uh, because um, with Buffalo now, we have six clusters uh, with like relatively wide uh, HST mosaic. Beforehand, only one cluster had a, a wide field HST mosaic, and that was MSO451. So 41 uh, uh, pointings of HST providing unique weak lensing data uh, with high, like high precision weak lensing analysis. And so most of her, uh, the start of her PhD was to work on this cluster and try to map the mass distribution also because it's extremely massive. Uh, it's a, it's a merging cluster uh, in the core. You can see two clear components. Um, it is also a cluster that could have been a, a really good uh, uh, candidate for possible large scale filament detection. Uh, because we had hints from previous ground-based uh, weak lensing analysis from Nicolas Martinet. 
So what you can see on the left is a pure, simple convergence map used, uh, uh, done by uh, uh, using CAS93, which is a simple inversion method uh, with weak lensing data only. It has no optimization, nothing. And then the a similar uh, map, but done with lens tools, so an optimized method that combines strong and weak lensing. Um, the, here, the, the, the message that um, uh, you need to uh, take home is, and this is another work from uh, Su Tiang, uh, because uh, she tested those two methods on uh, the Bahamas uh, uh, set of simulations and, um, and showed that depending on the science you want to do, uh, the two methods are going to be extremely useful. However, if you concentrate on the detection of substructures and possibly filaments, uh, you need to go for optimized versions and you need to go for the combination of uh, the lensing regimes. So, uh, quickly for the story of MSO451, what you can see here is the same convergence map, but where Suting has uh, subtracted the cluster core just to see the low mass uh, substructures and what remains. And so you can see in, uh, that she detects a lot of substructures, but only a few are the cluster redshift. Um, you can see uh, them highlighted in red. They have masses of the group, group, uh, group scale, so a few 10 to the 13 solar mass, so they're in falling objects. And that highlights the possibility of three uh, um, uh, um, preferred uh, directions, so possible fi uh, filament detection. If you look at the new image now, uh, on the right hand side, um, what you can see are uh, actually in magenta the contours from the brand based weak lensing analysis from Nicolas Martinet back in 2016. And you can see that apart from the most massive, so if I go back and forth, so basically substructure number two is detected in the brand based observation uh, analysis, but and substructure four. Um, Martin et al. discussed the, the, the possible detection of filaments, but this is basically kind of uh, uh, confirmed by uh, Su Tieng's analysis. Um, I'm, not, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna go any further into uh, the story of MSO451. The only thing that I'm gonna tell you is if you're, uh, taking, uh, if you're taking into account the Buffalo set of data that uh, we're getting now, is that such an analysis on 0451 uh, is extremely helpful because uh, it's an ideal test. Um, it's an ideal set of data to compare to simulations. So now we have six more clusters to come and uh, we might be able to put uh, a, a, a bit more stringent constraints on, uh, on uh, cluster evolution and uh, hopefully dark matter, um, uh, dark matter's uh, nature. Uh, last but not least, uh, really, uh, really, really nice uh, things that you can also do with lensing and, uh, and uh, frontier field slash buffalo type of data is you can actually detect really, really cool objects. So this is the first uh, strongly lensed, multiply imaged um, uh, supernova called, uh, uh, nicknamed Reptiles. Um, I'm happy to, uh, to tell you more about that uh, object because it's a fascinating one and also one that uh, demonstrated that our uh, mass modeling techniques, and I include most of the teams doing lensing, uh, cluster lensing in the community, are, yes, systematic limited, but uh, not that bad, because we could predict the reappearance of one of the image of the supernova, and most of them actually uh, uh, right. And uh, still, uh, in the same galaxy as Repsdal, we could uh, observe the first uh, lens star at a redshift of 1.5. Again, strongly lens and with a magnification factor predicted to be more than 10,000. And uh, again, I'm happy to tell you more about it. I'll just uh, quickly finish and conclude. Open collaboration. Uh, our observations uh, got completed uh, in June this year. Uh, if you want to join, this is really easy. You send me an email or uh, and or uh, to uh, Charles uh, Charles Steinhardt, uh, the other PI of the of the collaboration. Um, or if you just want to know more, you can follow us on Twitter and Facebook because this is how you do things uh, nowadays. And uh, and yes. Um, Remember, lensing is only a tool. Multi-wavelength um, combination with multi-wavelength is the key. 
and uh, cosmological tests are uh, needed, but can only most of them can only be done with this multi wavelength analysis. So basically, you need to turn to hydro uh, simulations. Um, I'll finish by advertising the, the work of, uh, of a few people. So Anna, uh, that I've already mentioned, uh, who started her postdoc in uh, Durham on the 1st of May. She hasn't been to Durham yet, by the way, because of the lockdown, but uh, she, uh, she's, she's being paid by Durham, so we say. Um, we have uh, so the, the, the overview paper of the, of the, of the program is out. Um, it was uh, published uh, a month back. Uh, we're working on the first cluster, ABLE 370, that was fully really observed. Uh, we have the first high redshift candidate uh, catalog that has been uh, um, distributed. Anna is finalizing the, the strong plus weak lensing analysis of ABLE 370, and with that, all the pipeline and the machinery, so you, we can run everything automatically on the other clusters. And the mass modeling challenge will uh, provide the models for ABLE 370 uh, by uh, the end of this year. Uh, Guillaume Maler, who is uh, also a postdoc at the uh, um, is a postdoc at uh, University of Michigan, is also joining Durham uh, in uh, November. Uh, David Lagatuta is also already in Durham, and Anna, who is not the other Anna Asibron, is not joining Durham. But I hope that I will get her to join Durham at some point. Uh, but anyway, all of these four are actually uh, running most of the working groups. And uh, so this is why the effort should be uh, acknowledged. And I will leave you here. Thank you.